Um, good morning to all of you. On behalf of Government Medical Officers Association and Society for Health Research and Innovation, I warmly welcome all of you to the workshop on common skin problems and mistakes encountered in the OPD setting. This is our sixth CPD program, and today we have about 500 doctors registered with us for this workshop. And this is a two hour workshop done by Dr. Nayani Madara Singha, consultant dermatologist at National Institute for Infectious Diseases and secretary for Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists. Please be kind enough to mute your microphones and your video cameras during the workshop. And if you have any questions, you can direct them to the lecturer by using a chat box. Now I warmly welcome Dr. Naini Madara Singh to start the workshop. Over to you, madam. Thank you. Uh, Very well, good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the GMO Expo uh, committee for inviting me to do this lecture today. And also it is very heartening to see this much of uh, numbers. Yeah. Now we will move on to our topic that is common skin problems and also the mistakes encountered in the OPD. Mm -hmm. So actually what I'm going to talk is like, uh, as you know, you may uh, know that uh, skin problems are very common in day-to-day -to -day -to -day practice. So I have identified few common problems and also I will be highlighting the mistakes done by medical officers. Actually, please don't take this as an offense. This will be just a learning uh, experience so that we can learn out of from our own mistakes. So uh, before going on to the individual cases, I would just get an approach to a patient with skin disease. So skin diseases are usually like, uh, dermatology is a visual specialty and skin diseases most of the time can be diagnosed by inspection. But sometimes this may be just the manifestation of an internal problem. Therefore, proper history taking and examination is important to in order to arrive at a proper diagnosis. Therefore, the general background of the patient and then the points specific to the skin disease, like any other, other associated factors like itching or burning sensation, and then the onset of the rash and how the rash has progressed, all these things are important. And then the associated factors, like for example, if a patient comes with acne, uh, we have to ask about any other associated factors like menstrual irregularities, uh, hair loss, hirsutism, just to find out whether there's a hormonal cause underlying this acne. And also the other most important thing is impact on quality of life. So as you know, skin diseases are visible and also there's a big stigma associated with these uh, skin diseases. Therefore, it may affect the patient's quality of life and there will be, uh, there will be, uh, may, can be profound psychological impact actually. Even in my experience, I have come across uh, two patients who have tried to commit suicide just because of the skin disease. Therefore, it is very important that you take uh, some extra time to see how much the disease has affected their quality of life. Then the examination, good light is very important for dermatological examination. That is what we say is usually direct sunlight. And then the proper exposure of the patient is important because sometimes what we see when the patient is partially exposed may be completely different picture uh, when the patient is fully exposed. Of course, we have to respect the patient's privacy when doing these examinations. So when it comes to the management of the skin disease, I think you will agree that patient expectations are always a cure. Like, uh, although they are having some other diseases which can be controlled with the uh, medication, but when it comes to skin disease, they want a cure. And also there are so many people out in the market who will uh, market a cure for most of the dermatological conditions. So we have to, add, if not a cure, we have to at least uh, offer a comparable service. I would say that most skin diseases can be successfully treated and controlled. Although if it is not a cure, uh, they can be successfully treated. And if we do this, our patients will not end up in this state. So now we will move on to the actual cases. Case number one, a 45 year old male presenting with an itchy skin rash for the last four months. 
The scratch started in the groin and later involved the other areas. So these are the medicines that uh, he uh, came up with. So actually when it comes to skin problems, people have the tendency to collect all these empty tubes and boxes, which is sometimes a nuisance for us, but sometimes it can be helpful to know what the medication the patient has received. The diagnosis is tinea incognito. So actually tinea incognito is a big name given uh, for just the tinea infections which have been previously treated for uh, with uh, topical steroids. Actually, this is a uh, mistake because tinea is a fungal infection. So uh, we will just talk about a few points about dermatophytosis. This is a disease of the stratum corneum of the skin, hair and nail, which is caused by a fungi called dermatophytosis. And it is commonly known as tinea or ringworm disease. Ringworm is the late term. So modes of transmission, it is usually transmitted by close contacts. This close contact can be with infected animals or humans. And also it is transmitted with airborne hair scales, formites, and uncommonly by soil. And the important factor is that infective spores in this hair and dermal scales can remain viable for several months and even years to be in the environment. Therefore, proper disinfection and personal hygiene is very important to prevent a recurrence of tinea infection. Clinical features. So this is actually the typical tinea, uh, like the typical skin lesion in tinea uh, infections. So I think you know, you are familiar with this. This uh, annular erythematous plaque, and you can see the active uh, edge with papules and pustules, and there will be central uh, clearing because actually because of this uh, clinical feature only, because we, uh, like a shape of a ring, they have got the name as ringworm disease. So depending on the site involved, there are different names for tinea infections like tinea corporis when it involves the uh, body and tinea cruris when it is involved in the groin, which is a very common presentation and tinea pedis. Actually, this can be missed because there are several forms of tinea pedis. I think you are familiar with this one with the uh, white hyperkeratotic plaque-like lesions in the interdigital areas. And then sometimes uncommonly you see this uh, scaly hyperkeratosis and sometimes even this blistering vesicubitus uh, type of tinea pedis as well. Then tinea manum is tinea involving the hands. Usually one hand is affected and one can get uh, mild erythema, which may not be obvious in our, our type of skin and scaling. This may be usually extension of the athlete's foot. When the, when the person is having tinea on feet, they tend to get the tinea on hands as well. Tinea angworm is the tinea involving the nails. So usually one or two nails are affected and the nails will be thickened, discolored and friable. And also there can be like uh, onycholysis, that is separation of the nail bed from the na uh, underlying nail uh, bed and also subangual hyperkeratosis can be seen. So now we will move on to the mistakes. I think I mentioned this earlier, that is the use of topical steroids. So to why do we give topical steroids? Sometimes we see even after diagnosing the patient with tinea and like referring the patient to the dermatologic clinics, still topical steroids are being given in the OPD. One thing is like it reduces the inflammation and so I think it is given for the symptomatic relief. Actually, although this was practiced some time back, this uh, practice is no longer recommendation because of the uh, emerging therapeutic resistance in uh, antifungal treatment for dermatophytosis. And also the, uh, the other common problem is like uh, steroid is given when the diagnosis is not clear. So what happens when we give a steroid to dermatophytosis? One thing, it will alter the clinical presentation. Therefore, I will uh, give you the pictures later. Therefore, the <coughs> subsequent diagnosis is going to be difficult. 
and also with the steroids it will reduce the inflammation and scaling therefore even for a test it will be difficult to obtain skin scales for a diagnostic uh, microscopic testing and the other important thing is steroids will reduce the localized uh, reduction of t cell t cell mediated immunity and reduce host mediated inflammation therefore what will happen is there will be ineffective elimination of the dermatophyte thereby it will cause chronic widespread and difficult to treat lesions actually this is the major problem that we are facing nowadays because of the topical usage of steroids in dermatophyte uses and actually i am uh, yeah so these are the clinical features like you can see now initially i showed a lesion which you have a like a, a typical ring like lesion but when they are treated with to, uh, topical steroids what will happen is this ring is broken and what you get is only a broken ring and the inflammation would be masked and but sometimes there can be aggressive inflammation with pustules as well as in this one and also i think you can see the uh, hyperpigmentation in this finger so that is due to the side effect of steroid so even if the patient does not say that the patient has received a steroid by just by looking at this we can see um, diagnose that it is a tinea incognito the importance of knowing whether the patient was given a steroid or not is that uh, if this uh, patient has been given a topical steroids earlier that requires longer duration of oral antifungals so it is going to be a burden for the patient this is another characteristic form which is known as uh, ring within ring appearance like you get uh, concentric two or three rings Uh, with the usage of intermittent uh, usage of topical steroids this i think you can see like enderm is a like a potent topical steroid so probletzol we usually not even recommended for the face but this has been given in this tinea facial and this is also again uh, extensive tinea porporis you can i think you can appreciate there's there's minimal scaling and inflammation in this lesion so sometimes it's going to be a diagnostic difficulty so actually the usage of steroids i'm not saying without any facts we did a, a multi center uh, uh, study involving representations on all provinces like uh, representations of the nine provinces in sri lanka and out of the patients who are presenting to the dermatology clinics with dermatophytosis about 42% patients have been earlier treated with steroids so when we then we went on to see from whom they had got this steroids so it was not self prescription it was not pharmacy the major proportion was from the opd doctors or by the general practitioners so actually it is a failure of the medical system it is partly we are responsible for not educating you all and then uh, i mean it is a uh, actually it was very disheartening to see these results so then actually because of this the sri lanka college of dermatologists uh, took measures uh, like we were really uh, interested in uh, teaching and also like we wrote to the nmra about this triple combination creams so because of this from uh, last year the new registrations of triple combination creams are banned from the by the nmra so whatever that is there available in the market is the ones which have got the previous registration but they will not be able to renew their license so i think uh, if you are uh, like you take it as a point not to use this triple combinations i mean they are of no use so that will be a uh, a major achievement if at least uh, this can be uh, like i mean terminated from our practice so then moving on to topical antifungals topical antifungals are usually recommended for single lesions tinea cruris which is not initially treated by uh, steroids and also when systemic drugs are contraindicated so then the question is which topical agent actually there's no hard and fast rule 
it can be variable. Usually, ASOs are considered as a general first line. And also, if one is combining a topical antifungal and oral antifungal, it is always good to add uh, uh, drugs from two different groups because that will reduce the resistance. Systemic antifungals indications are tinea capitis, tinea pedis, onychomycosis, and then extensive tinea corpus. Actually, the duration and dose will vary depending on the location, but usually a minimum of two weeks of oral antifungals are recommended. And uh, th there can be slight variations depending on the location. So then the question is, which drug can be used? So I think, uh, so the next uh, mistake is not giving the pro proper oral antifungal drug. So this is again an online survey done a few months back. Uh, like uh, involving 54 general practitioners and the common use drug was fluconazole. I, I'm actually yet to see uh, the questionnaires that y'all have filled up. So fluconazole we see quite commonly being practiced uh, by medical officers for tinea infections and the dose that is being usually being given is the 150 milligrams weekly dose. But uh, when it comes to the prescription of systemic antifungals for dermatophytosis, what is recommended are itraconazole, terpenophene, and brucephilbene. Because of the low cost and the availability in our hospitals, we tend to give brucephilbene, but sometimes you might have to give the other two uh, commonly because of this uh, drug resistance as well. Then what about fluconazole? So actually, fluconazole is not usually considered as effective for dermatophytosis. Some, there are some studies which shows that efficacy with 50 mg daily dose, not the 150 mg weekly dose that is being commonly practiced. And also, it is a worry that the frequent usage of fluconazole for dermatophytosis may in turn cause resistant strains of candidiasis developing. Therefore, please reserve your flu console in treating candidiasis only, not for tinea infections. Then the mistake number three is inadequate duration. So how long do we have to continue? This of course, as I said earlier, will vary depending on the drug, depending on the site of infection, but it is important that we give the topicals at least two weeks post resolution of uh, clinical symptoms. And then when it comes to oral, uh, it varies depending on the site. So why I'm saying this is like there's emerging therapeutic failure for dermatophytosis. Like not like antibiotics, we have only three, uh, like three or four antifungals to deal with. So Atenias becoming resistant to ther uh, therapy is going to be a major issue. So these are the mistakes that we can do uh, like to prevent, like, I mean, minimize this therapeutic failure from our side. So I hope you will take this into your uh, attention. So take home messages like diagnosis. If not sure, just treat symptomatically with antihistamines, not steroids and proper and adequate treatment and also you have to take measures to prevent recurrences and reinfection. Thereby, like there, the patient education is important and timely referral. Little bit about tinea capitis as well. Tinea capitis is the tinea infection involved in the hair follicles. So it could be like a non-inflammatory tinea, which manifests as scaling and non-scarring alopecia. Sometimes if a tinea, uh, which is a, of animal origin uh, get, uh, is the cause, you get an inflammatory tinea cavities, <clears throat> which is also known as a chiria. So what is the common mistake here is this is being misdiagnosed as an abscess and the patient will end up with a large wound. So the treatment is actually uh, topicals are not effective because we have to uh, treat the hair follicle, which is deep. So we have to treat with uh, oral antifungals. And the important thing of uh, why this is uh, important to detect this early because Kirion can end up with 
uh, scarring alopecia. So early treatment will prevent the scarring alopecia from occurring. And when it comes to tinea, Lucifulvin is the recommended like, I mean, the uh, drug of choice and the dose is 10 to 20 milligram per kg per day. And we might, might have to uh, treat this for a period of six to eight weeks. So now we will move on to the case number two. It's a 52 year old female presenting with multiple leg ulcers, which are painful and recurrent over last three years. Mistake number one is not diagnosing the cause of the leg ulcers. So there are many causes of leg ulcers and the uncommon causes may be diagnosed only if they're suspected. So sometimes this may need a skin biopsy uh, can be helpful at times. So uh, talking about the causes of the leg ulcers, these are the uh, common causes like chronic venous insufficiency, chronic arterial insufficiency, neuropathic ulcers, diabetes, and lymphedema. Then you have a whole range of uncommon causes of leg ulcers too. Although I say these are uncommon, they are not that uncommon because we see them in our day-to-day -day practice. So infections. When we talk about infective causes of leg, leg ulcers, it can be many. Like it could be uh, leprosy, atypical mycobacteria, fungal infections, and sometimes leishmaniasis. Malignancies, of course, you have to be vigilant to detect these. And then the inflammatory causes like pyoderma gangliosum, vasculitis, connective tissue disorders, and rheumatoid arthritis. Livedoid vasculopathy is an uh, vaso-occlusive disease. And then sometimes uh, drugs like warfarin and heparin can uh, give rise to uh, leg gases. And there are other causes like hemolytic anemias and calciphylaxis. So talking about these uncommon causes of leg gases, pyoderma gangrenosum, I think it is like the typical feature is this bluish undermined edge that you see in pyoderma gangrenosum. These are like very painful ulcers. They start with a, like a papule or pustule and then rapidly develop into this ulceration. So apart from the usual management of ulcers, they will rapidly respond to like topical or oral steroids. And sometimes we have to go on to see, use the other immunosuppressants as well. So why it is important to diagnose the case of the cause of the leg cancer is the management is totally different because we have to treat the cause of this leg ulceration. This is uh, vasculitis. Again, there will be uh, painful punched out ulcers. So what we usually see as vasculitis is the palpable perfuric lesions involving the lower limbs. That is usually seen when the uh, vasculitis affects the small, vessel, uh, small vessels. But when it is occurring in medium vessel vasculitis as in uh, ankle associated vasculitis and polyarthritis nodosa, people can develop uh, leg ulcers. So here, here again, the diagnostic uh, factor will, will be the skin biopsy, and then the treatment will be according to the cause of the vasculitis. Then cutaneous leishmaniasis. I think uh, for the people who are working in endemic areas of uh, leishmaniasis, like Polonarua, Anuradhapura, and even down south, this may not be a problem because I used to work in Anuradhapura, and like even medical students would be, were able to diagnose acute genius leishmaniasis as they enter the clinic. But uh, like in other people in other areas may not be very familiar with acute genius leishmaniasis. But leishmaniasis is nowadays not limited to those areas. Actually, it is seen all over in the country. And any answer which is not responding to uh, uh, maybe for the conventional treatment, we might have to think of this diagnosis and, uh, and these will respond very rapidly to intralational sodium stibogluconate injections. So the management will be totally uh, changing with the diagnosis of cutaneous leishmaniasis. Squamous cell carcinoma. So this is actually, we have to be very vigilant and like uh, any ulcer which is not responding and with inverted edges, we have to suspect a carcinoma. Although you might say that 
we will not miss a patient like this, but this is actually a patient who has been getting treatment. Even now you can see the purplish color. Somebody has been trying to put a uh, violet as the uh, ulcer management here. So we have to actually prevent this state of uh, skin malignancy is being detected at this stage. It has to be detected way early than this. Levitide vasculopathy. Again, this is not so uncommon because this occurs with uh, in association with chronic venous insufficiency. And these are very painful uh, punched out ulcers. And also in the background, uh, sometimes you can see a reticulate purpura and uh, ecchymosis. And these ulcers heal with uh, typical uh, white porcelain like uh, scars. So here uh, there can be an associated increased hypercoagulable state and the treatment is usually with aspirin and antibiotic drugs and sometimes even warfarin or the treatment of chronic venous insufficiency. So then apart from the causes, now we will go on to the mistake number two, that is giving antibiotics inappropriately. So as you know, Antibiotics do not heal ulcers. And too much antibiotics may cause resistance. So antibiotics should be reserved only when there's clinical evidence of infection is present. So there's actually like when we take this uh, uh, thing called uh, wound con uh, infection continuum. So like any chronic ulcer may be having some amount of uh, microorganisms in the ulcer. So it could be either contamination or colonization. So in these two states, actually the microorganisms are living in harmony with the ulcer environment without causing any further damage or impedance to the uh, wound healing process. But when the uh, microbial virulence or the number is increasing, it uh, becomes into this stage that is the local infection and then it can spread to the surrounding uh, tissue and it can even cause systemic infection which needs uh, systemic antibiotics. So antibiotics are actually indicated only after the third stage that is the local infection. So how do we diagnose like this local infection could be either uh, covered infection or overt infection. Actually, the covered infection is the most important thing because that is the turning point. We have to be very vigilant to identify at this point. And even this covered local infection can be uh, managed without antibiotics with rotational dressings and antiseptics. But uh, we have to manage it uh, quickly and properly to prevent them uh, moving on to the next stages. So if there's any fiber granulation, if there are breaching and pocketing in granulation tissue, wound breakdown and enlargement, and delayed wound healing, new or increasing pain and increasing malnourder, we have to think of uh, ongoing covered infection. So the infection, when you get the proper overt local infection, you get the all the features of uh, cellulitis with erythema, local warmth, swelling and virulent discharge. So this is the period that actually should be managed with either sometimes even topical antibiotics would be enough if it's a mild infections, but uh, some, uh, sometimes oral antibiotics are needed. Few words about biofilms when I'm talking about the wound ulcers. So biofilms are seen in many chronic wounds. Actually, this is a complex collection of organisms which are bound together in extracellular matrix. So when there's a biofilm, there are less, the wounds are like covered with this and we need to do wound debridement because uh, it is less susceptible to antiseptics and antibiotics. And also the occurrence of biofilm can delay the wound healing. So therefore, there is the place for mechanical debridement of the wounds, which is why it is important. Then the mistake number three is taking too many swaps for culture. So as I mentioned earlier, all chronic wounds may have some amount of microorganisms. So do we have to swap? Because there will be, anyway, there will be colonization and you will get a culture positivity. 
So if it is a mild infection, actually we don't have to do a swab. We can just treat with the conventional antibiotics, but swabs are needed when the ulcers are not responding to the initial antibiotics and when atypical organisms are suspected. And also if we were to do a swab, we have to take the swab in the correct manner with proper wound cleaning. And then we have to take a deep swab and otherwise what we will get, get up the culture positivity is the, is the colonizing uh, organisms. So this is an example to show that wounds do heal without antibiotics and swabs. So I think uh, we have come to the case number three. This is a very common presentation. It is a 32 year old female presenting with increased hair shedding over the last three months. And I would think that uh, hair loss is a very common presentation both to the primary care physicians and dermatologists. And of course, for us, like even more than 75% of the patients will have hair loss, even as a subsidiary uh, complaint. And this can have a profound psychological impact for the people as well. So this is, this is a vulnerable population. Therefore, there are people in the out there in the market who will like to grab this uh, vulnerable population. Therefore, like, I mean, as healthcare professionals, we have to do a proper job. And also we have to be, we should be able to give the proper advice to the patients. So mistake number one, not detecting the normal hair loss. So as I said earlier, like this is a very common complaint. So is all, all these patients who are coming with hair shedding, are they having a significant hair fall? Most of the time, not. That is because now the hair grows in a, a cycle and like there are three phases, like it is an anagen phase, that is the uh, phase that the hair uh, fiber is increasing in length and depending on the length of the anagen, the, uh, the length of the hair will vary. And then you, the hair uh, goes to a form which is called a catagen. That is a transient phase of two weeks. There, the hair, uh, the cell apoptosis uh, stops, and the hair follicle uh, releases from the uh, in, uh, from the beneath dermal papilla. And then the hair uh, comes to a, fa a phase called telogen. That is the resting phase. And after this uh, telogen phase, which is usually three months, the hair will fall, and there will be another hair follicle which is uh, coming up so this cycle continues and when we take a scalp when we take a scalp at one given moment about 80 to 90 percent of our hair will be in anagen phase but there will be about 10 percent of the hair which is in the telogen and this hair should fall for the new hair to come so if a patient is having even 50 to 100 hairs uh, hair shedding per day without any hair thinning. That is a normal phenomenon because there will be any day about 10% of the hair should are in the intelligent phase, which should shed. Then mistake number two, not identifying the cause for the hair loss. Most of the time we think that vitamin deficiencies are the only cause for the hair loss. It is not. So I would be talking about diffuse hair loss because this is the most common presentation mostly in females and sometimes in males as well. These are the common causes of uh, diffuse hair loss like acute telogen effluvium, chronic telogen effluvium, diffuse alopecia areata and androgenic alopecia. So telogen nephrium, the what we call as acute telogen nephrium, is like the increased shedding of telogen hair over a short period. So I mentioned earlier that the hair goes in cycles and there's a phase called telogen. So when there's an acute stressful event such as a surgery or even severe viral infection, I think we see this mostly after severe dengue infections and even childbirth the hair will fall in automatically it will go to the telogen phase. So it will be not be that 10% that I mentioned earlier, even 80 to 90% of the hair can turn into the telogen phase. So three months, the telogen phase is usually three months. So three months after this telogen phase, this, has, this hair has to fall. 
so this is what we see as like uh, now three months after the childbirth uh, people come and say when the baby is smiling the mother's hair is falling so that is a very common uh, is concept so uh, likewise uh, sometimes people can't remember this acute uh, stressful event which has happened three four months back but they just come uh, with the uh, hair shedding so this hair shedding is reversible it can be quite alarming because uh, like i mean large amounts of hair can be shed but it is reverse reversible so we have to reassure the patients and it usually lasts a period of less than six months uh, then you have the other variety that is the chronic telogen FDM. There again, it is the shedding of telogen here, but it lasts long, longer than the normal six months. And the onset is not so acute. It is a slow onset. And also one can't identify an inciting event. Actually, chronic telogen FDM is the commonest cause of hair loss in adult females but sometimes this can be uh, difficult to differentiate from early pattern hair loss actually what we call as pattern hair loss is the balding process this happens both in females and males but in males there's a typical pattern uh, but in females you get this as a diffuse hair loss so causes of chronic telogen FDM. Actually, this is the indication where we have to do uh, blood investigations to identify the <clears throat> uh, causes of hair loss. So like medical problems like SLA, chronic renal failure and liver disease. And then you have the hormonal problems like hyper or hypoparathyroidism. Uh, then sometimes polycystic ovarian diseases, nutritional deficiencies like iron, zinc, calcium, and vitamin D and the drug history is also important because there are many drugs which are known to be associated with chronic telogen FDM and sometimes there is a as in any other entity there is an idiopathic entity as well for chronic telogen FDM because there are so much talk about biotin for hair loss i thought of looking for the evidence for biotin I think this has this this is being widely prescribed and also patients uh, take to take this over the counter. So when we uh, look at the biotin daily intake, it is 30 micrograms per day, and we don't have our data. But in Western populations, typical dietary intake of biotin is between 35 to 70, so that is well above the daily adequate intake. And also. True biotin deficiency in healthy individuals is not known. So usually biotin deficiency is associated with malabsorption syndromes. And the interesting thing is there's lack of sufficient evidence for improvement hair loss with biotin, but still it is being widely used. And the usual biotin supplementation is 500 to 1000 micrograms per day. And I think you can see that in Sri Lanka, we have even 10,000 micrograms biotin capsules. So you can decide on your own, like the usage and the importance of UQM biotin for hair loss. Then we come to another very important mistake that is not identifying scarring alopecia. So what happens in scarring alopecia is scarring, in scarring alopecia, the inflammation occurs in the hair bulge region where the stem cells are located. Whereas in uh, non-scarring alopecia, uh, the inflammation occurs in the bulb region. So in, when the uh, stem cells are affected with the inflammation, even if the cause is uh, treated, the damage which is done would be going to be permanent and they develop scarring alopecia. So how can we identify this scarring alopecia? So if we see a scarring alopecia, you don't see any hair follicle openings. But in a non-scarring alopecia, if you have a close examination, you can see even if there are no hairs, you can just see the hair follicles. So this is actually, I think you will be able to identify the scarring here. You can see this shiny glistening skin. And if you do a close ex examination, you won't see any hair follicles. So actually, although they, the, these two look uh, like, I mean, more or less same when you just have a quick look, but these are two entirely different causes. One is a pseudopallad 
that is a scarring alopecia and the other one is a severe pattern loss in a female. So the management is entirely different and our scarring alopecia, we need to act quickly. So why it is important to identify the scarring alopecia is that once the damage is established, it is going to be irreversible. So we have to act quickly and treat the cause to prevent the and minimize the hair loss. And sometimes scalp biopsies are needed. Then we come to uh, mistake number four. And I think this is just uh, like uh, just for information that is like assuming there's no treatment for androgenic alopecia. So we should be uh, like educated to uh, uh, treat our patients and to direct them. Like uh, now most of the time, if androgenic alopecia, that is a normal balding process, if it is treated early with topical minoxidil, you can see excellent results. So uh, these are actually some uh, examples of even advanced hair loss, which have been treated with uh, top aminoxidil, antiandrogens, and sometimes with platelet rich plasma therapy. And you can see the improvement is uh, quite obvious. So it is not a disease that there is no treatment. Yeah. So we have actually uh, finished about uh, three cases. So uh, I would uh, just uh, think that it would be good to take a small break and then we will be continuing with the other uh, cases later on.